Ever wonder what really happened that led to nearly 96% of all species on Earth going extinct at the end of the Paleozoic era? Well, in today's video, I'm going to be talking about the Great Dying, or the largest extinction event of all time. This is one of the big five recognized major mass extinctions throughout Earth's history, and it happened at the end of the Permian period, which is the last period in the Paleozoic era. We can see on this big diversity chart here that the five big dips, or the late Ordovician, late Devonian, and Permian, which is the one we're talking about today, and Triassic and end Cretaceous extinctions are all plotted here throughout Earth's history. Number three here, the end Permian, was the largest extinction event of all time. However, many times people incorrectly state that nearly 96% of all life on Earth went extinct due to this end Permian extinction event. That is actually incorrect because that percentage actually includes the devastation from an earlier extinction event earlier in the Permian period called the end Guadalupian extinction event. Just to show you where we're at in the timeline here, the Permian period was the last period in the Paleozoic era as shown on this time scale, going from oldest to youngest from bottom to top. And it goes from around 299 to around 251 or 52 million years ago. And at the very end of the Permian, around 251 million years ago, 60% of all genera and 80% of all species were wiped out, which is still the largest extinction event ever, so it's still pretty devastating. But the Guadalupian extinction, which occurred right at the end of the Guadalupian series or epoch within the Permian, marine life was hit just as hard as it was during the KPG or Cretaceous Paleogene extinction that wiped out the dinosaurs. And although it wasn't as severe as the end Permian extinction, many people argue that it should be included in the big major extinction events of which we have five currently. So it would be the sixth one, unless you count today as the sixth one. So maybe the seventh, but anyway, it should be included probably. So we'll talk about the Guadalupian extinction event first, and then we'll get into the end Permian great dying extinction event. This extinction event marked a major decline of reef building, sponges, and rugose corals. And this event was actually one of the four largest episodes of species loss amongst reef builders in the Phanerozoic, which includes the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic eras, aka around 500 million years ago to present. And during this event, reef carbonate productivity decreased by 90%. So the production of carbonate by reef builders decreased by 90%. And recovery of reefs, which are ecologically essential organisms and communities, took nearly five to seven million years, only to then be decimated again at the Permo-Triassic extinction, or the late or end Permian extinction. Forams or foraminifera were also hit hard during this period, and these are also carbonate precipitating organisms, although they're microorganisms, they're not as macro as coral reefs, but they're still very important ecologically and produce a lot of carbonate. And one type of foram called fusilinids, which were crazy abundant during the late Paleozoic, went nearly extinct during the Guadalupian extinction. All of their later, larger, more complex forms Forms, like the families Neoschwangerinidae or Verabucinids went extinct due to this extinction event, and then the complete extinction of Fusilinids occurred in the later end Permian extinction. Only smaller and morphologically simpler forms of forams survived this Guadalupean extinction, and the initial decline of fusilinids at this extinction event probably made their extinction more likely during the later extinction event. Overall, with all the effects the Guadalupean extinction event had on carbonate precipitating organisms, there was a fundamental change in carbonate production. That is, it went from being mainly bioprecipitated or biologically induced mineralization to chemically precipitated or abiotically produced, which was due to a decline of carbonate precipitating organisms. There was also declines of photosymbiotic fusilinins, bivalves or clams, and corals, potentially due to loss of their symbiotic algae, like the bleaching of corals today. That's due to the loss of their algae because of the changing environment. So that could have potentially been the reason for the decline of the photosymbiotic species at this time as well. 
In any case, the Guadalupean extinction event was much harder on marine life than it was on terrestrial life. But what caused the Guadalupean event to begin with? It's likely that volcanism caused this event, specifically the volcanic eruptions that formed the Emishan or Emishan flood deposits in China. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Sorry if I'm not. In any case, these lava flows initially covered an area of over a million square kilometers. And we can see the little red dot here that shows those deposits in the map of the continental formation that would have been occurring at that time. And we can also see the signature of volcanism in ocean sediments at the time, which show elevated mercury, which is a signature of volcanism. And then we also see a negative carbon isotope excursion due to a decrease in primary productivity and also the release of uh, isotopically light carbon from the volcanoes. But volcanism alone didn't cause the extinctions. It caused what started the extinctions. That is global warming, ocean anoxia, or the lack of oxygen in the ocean, and ocean acidification. Global warming due to the volcanic release of CO2 and methane led to the ocean acidification, stagnation, and anoxia in what's called an OAE or an ocean anoxic event. And the lack of oxygen caused a lot of death among marine animals, which is why this event hit marine life harder than land life. But now getting to the end Permian extinction event, the Great Dying, the largest extinction of all time. This extinction event affected both marine life and terrestrial life, but we'll start with the marine effects first. The marine life that was affected included the extinction of fusilinids, rugose, and tabulate corals, trilobites, which dominated Paleozoic seas, and conodonts. And it caused the decline of forams other than fusilinids, and nautiloids and ammonoids, brachiopods, crinoids, echinoids, and bryozoans. But terrestrial life, like I mentioned, was also impacted. For example, many woody conifers and other gymnosperms died out and were replaced by small lycopods. I talk about lycopods in my Ice Age and Giant Insects video about the Carboniferous and how they got huge in the Carboniferous, like 100 foot tall lycopod trees uh, that covered swampy areas and then died and accumulated to make the vast coal deposits that give the Carboniferous its name. But in this case, we're talking much smaller lycopods. And it's just dawning on me that it might be lysopods. I really hope it's lycopods. Lysopods would be weird. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Anyway, other than plants, insects, and therapsids were also hit very hard. Just to recap, therapsids are a branch of amniotes that led to mammals. And amniotes, which evolved from amphibians in the Carboniferous, are distinguished by their eggs. Basically, they have a membrane-protected embryo and a lack of larva stage, and modern amniotes include mammals, birds, and reptiles. One of the few therapsid genera to survive this extinction event was Lystrosaurus. I hope I'm saying that right. And we can see a picture of this guy here as well as in the thumbnail for this video. And they grew to dominate after this extinction event because after an extinction event, the environments and ecological niches are pretty much cleared out and whatever survived can radiate because there's nothing to compete with or run away from. So now that we know the effects of the Impermian extinction were so drastic, we're probably wondering what caused this extinction event in the first place. Was there an asteroid impact? What happened? Well, there was no asteroid impact to set off climate change that caused an extinction event like at the end of the Cretaceous. Instead, what happened was temperature gradients from equator poles decreased with increased global warming, causing oceans to become stagnant and anoxic. The reason temperature gradients are important is because they greatly affect ocean circulation because strong temperature gradients from equator to poles mean strong winds and mean strong surface ocean circulation and upwelling and mixing of the the ocean and well oxygenated oceans, whereas weak temperature gradients cause the opposite and eventually lead to stagnant and anoxic oceans that aren't well mixed and aren't well oxygenated. We can see this in the rock record with a switch from red to gray marine sediments at the end of the Guadalupian, which marks the end Guadalupian extinction, and then a switch from the gray to pretty much pitch black at the end of the Permian. 
ocean acidification, just like with the end Guadalupean extinction, also played a major role. In fact, the fossil record indicates that carbonate precipitating organisms constructed smaller shells that were more organic rich to cope with the ocean acidification during this time. In short, carbonate precipitation is favored in alkaline conditions and not acidic ones. And the acidification of the ocean would mean that carbonate precipitation is less favorable for the biological organisms that secrete it to create their skeletons or shells. And so they would have incorporated more organic matter, less carbonate to account for this acidification and also would have made smaller shells and skeletons. The formation of Pangaea, however, is not to be forgotten. During this time, Gondwana land had collided with the northern continental masses to become Pangaea, one massive supercontinent, which was actually pretty high in terms of elevation, whereas the one big ocean at the time was pretty deep. This changed both ocean circulation and caused a great regression. Regression, or the lowering of sea level, causing the movement of the basin margin, basin word, or sea word, would have eliminated shallow epicontinental seas, which hosted a lot of life during any time that they've existed on continents, and all the life that inhabited them would have also become eliminated. The changes in ocean circulation would have also exacerbated the ocean stagnation and anoxia, further exacerbating the extinctions occurring to marine life. But just like with the end Guadalupean extinction, there had to have been a cause for the second spike in global warming that then caused the ocean anoxia and acidification, etc. Formation of Pangaea not only contributed to a loss of epicontinental seas and changes in ocean circulation, but also set up vast arid climates with evaporate basins and immense dune fields. If you know anything about the Carboniferous, which is the period just before the Permian period, this was a very swampy, moist time with wetlands and tropical forests. And because of the drying, rainforests were replaced by herbaceous vegetation in the tropics and carbon burial in coal swamps, which characterized the Carboniferous period, decreased drastically, leading to an increase in CO2 and global warming due to increasing greenhouse gas effect. This global warming would have then been exacerbated by the melting of methane hydrates and the release of that methane to the atmosphere because methane is just like carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas. In fact, it's a much more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. But the real cause that really just set off the end Permian extinction event and all of these climatic changes that were associated with it was the eruptions of the Siberian traps. These volcanic eruptions are estimated to have caused lava flows that covered an area of over 5 million square kilometers. And I've seen estimates of seven or eight or more. So I don't know exactly the estimate, but that's a lot. And it was much larger than the around 1 million square kilometer lava flows of the end Guadalupian. So it was an even larger event, which is why eventually the extinction event was even more drastic in association with a symphony of climate disasters and the formation of Pangaea and ocean circulation change and all of these things that came together. But this was really like the initial cause of the warming because all of this volcanism, which erupted for two million years, caused a sharp increase in atmospheric CO2 because that's what volcanoes release. And it released so many harmful gases that it even damaged the ozone layer, causing an increase in UV radiation and exacerbating extinctions during the time. In any case, I want to make sure to express that this was a symphony of events that was initially set off by this volcanism, but a bunch of other things that also happened to coincide with it. And the events leading up to this end Permian mass extinction like the end Guadalupean extinction and just before that in the late Carboniferous and Ice Age of all things really helped to make this the most devastating extinction event to ever happen on Earth. But that is all I have for this video. I know it was kind of gloomy talking about largest extinction of all time, but I don't think of it as necessarily a bad thing. I think it's really actually incredible how life has recovered after major extinction events like this one and the others throughout Earth's history. I mean, extinction is necessary for 
evolution and, you know, diversification and radiation events to occur. So it just, you know, makes Earth history exciting to me, I think. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed. If you want to check out the major reference I'm using for this and other videos in my historical geology playlist, it's called Earth System History. It's linked in my description below as are other references always in my videos linked in my description. And if you want to check out related videos to this one on the Ice Age and giant insects that came before the Permian and the Carboniferous and or late Paleozoic life, which is a video I talk about the life in the late Paleozoic, you can check those out as well as just any event in Earth's history in my historical geology playlist, which should pop up on the screen at any moment now. So anyway, thanks so much for watching and I will see you guys next time. Bye.